So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the president and CEO of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, Claire Richardson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire and Tara, for nice introductions. And thank you very much to the development team at Zoo Atlanta for inviting me to give this uh, lecture this evening. It's a real honor for me to be able to share some of the news from the field on behalf of all of the staff in Rwanda and, and working with us in Congo. So I'm just going to, I am, as Claire said, the director of Karasoki Research Center. So my talk this evening is going to focus really on Karasoki and the work that we are doing there. And then perhaps if there's wider questions at the end, Tara and Claire can, can help 
field questions. So, um, and I see this a little bit as an update in some ways because I was invited here in 2005 to give a, a, a talk. So um, this is sort of where we are today with uh, gorillas with a little bit look at our history. So just to, to, to start with, is a reminder of the different populations and the different species of gorillas which are found in Africa. There's two different species, the eastern and the, the western gorilla. This is the western gorilla here and the eastern species coming up here. You can see that, you can see in the, the corner of the photos, it says CE, which means critically endangered. And what's of uh, importance, this is, this, is a, um, this is according to the IUCN, which, is, which categorizes the endangered level of different uh, species around the world. Um, and what is new this year is that the western lowland gorilla has been reassessed and has been classified as critically endangered due to the rapid or castor, uh, castor, I can't say, <laughs> dramatic decline uh, in, the, in the gorilla numbers um, since surveys first started. We still have a problem putting exact numbers to, to these gorillas simply because a lot of these forests are very inaccessible um, and we're still developing accurate survey techniques to be able to put numbers. Um, but where we're going to be talking today is the uh, uh, mountain gorillas, which are found on um, an island of habitat between Rwanda, Congo, and Uganda. And this is the chain of the Virungas disappearing up there to your, to your right. Karasoki Research Center was established in 1967. It's our 40th anniversary which we're very, very proud of. Um, it's, overall, it's been a, and you'll, you'll see today, it's an incredible success story, both for, the, for, for, for mountain gorilla conservation. Um, when Diane first started the, the center in the, uh, in the 1960s, the focus was on, on research, to basically find out more about mountain gorillas in order that we could better protect them. And this was, Difficult during the 1990s when the focus became on protecting the gorillas. As Claire alluded to, this period was a period of great insecurity in this region of the world, um, and our efforts were focused on the daily monitoring and protection of the gorillas. And then from 2000 onwards, we've been able to return to our research focus, initiate education programs, and always continue with the protection work of the mountain gorillas. So just a little bit more detail on this background. Um, as Claire just talked about, as Diane wrote in her book, little did I know then that by setting up two small tents in the wilderness of the Virungas, I had launched the beginnings of what was to become an internationally renowned research station, eventually to be utilized by students and scientists from many, from many countries. Um, Diane set her research station up in the volcanoes, between, in the saddle of two volcanoes, Karasoki, um, Karasimbi and Rusoki. This, this, uh, the original objectives of Dianthosis were to apply field primatology methods to the study of gorillas in order to understand better their ecology, their demography, and their social organization. In order to be able to do this, Diane had to habituate gorillas, that means make the gorillas used to human uh, observation, and then most importantly, study individuals. So once she had gained their trust, she was able to start identification which we can see here now uh, on your bottom left-hand side. That's a stylized. I should have a point. That's a stylized drawing of a gorilla's nose print. Just like our fingerprints, every gorilla has an, 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 a unique nose print, and that's what we use to this day to identify the gorillas throughout the range, um, uh, throughout their range in, in the Virunga volcanoes. The key research findings during this time by Diane Fossey and her colleagues. Uh, students from many universities around, around the world, were basic observations on diet and foraging patterns, ranging patterns, information on social organization. Um, at that point, we, little information was known about group structure, family, family structure, group size. Um, the mountain gorillas was one of the first species to have in the practice of infanticide recorded. Um, it was also during this time that the very things we take, we find now common across all gorilla species, like female dispersal patterns, 
male dispersal, the solitary males, all of this information was gathered in the early years. And importantly for conservation, work was undertaken to count the number of gorillas. And this is something that's been repeated regularly over time so that we can monitor the population growth. However, during that time, Diane also saw the problem of human encroachment on the park. A lot of the land was, was lost um, by cat or degraded by cattle grazing. There was also a project where uh, the National Park in Rwanda has been reduced by 50% for the planting of an agricultural crop, pyrethrum. And also there was the direct poaching of gorillas for body parts. Um, and this is Diane's favorite gorilla, uh, Digit, here. So Diane switched her attention, her personal attention, to what she termed active conservation. Um, this is a time before the current national park services existed. Um, and Diane was able with the help of some funding, to set up a small team of anti-poaching staff and to start doing patrols around the park. And you can see here the, the, the quantity of snares that were recovered from the park. These are snares which have been set for a small antelope, for basically for subsistence living. Um, but the danger is that the gorillas also can become caught in those snares, particularly the inquisitive juvenile gorillas. Um, and many have lost their lives as a result. Diane was, uh, was tragically killed in uh, 1985 and is uh, buried up at the old site of Karasoki in the, in, um, in the forest. And so this marked, this was a, this marked a, a tragic end, um, but the, the work that she did was able to be transmitted to the international community through her, bo her book, Gorillas uh, in the Mist, and through the film uh, where actress Sigourney Weaver plays Diane Fossey. And this was really an important turning point for gorilla conservation because it brought international attention. It's brought the, the tourists who now come to Rwanda and play an important part in the economic regeneration of the country, and it's brought funds from U.S. tax dollars from individuals and um, to support gorilla conservation. The 1990s was a difficult time to continue their work, no less, because of the insecurity in Rwanda. Um, basically, we read here, civil war broke out in Rwanda in October 1990, um, and by 1998, the staff at Karasoki, the expatriate staff, had evacuated camp five times. The facility in the forest was destroyed three times rebuilt twice, and eventually relocated to a nearby town, which is where we're based today. Um, remarkably to me, and uh, many others, the, our Rwandan staff continued to track and observe the guerrillas throughout the eight years of war. With, we had only one period of interruption in all of the long-term data for 15 months. And it's really a testament to the, to the bravery of the staff during this time that the guerrillas have were protected and that we have this wealth of data um, on the gorilla families we study. So Karasoki today, we've grown a little bit since, Karas uh, since Dan Fossey first arrived with a porter and a cook. Uh, we now have 84 staff members that are involved in the different research programs, protection and monitoring. Um, Ecosystem Health is a program with the local communities around the park working on health and sanitation issues education program, getting students um, involvement, working with some of the, the gorillas that have been confiscated by poaching and our, our support staff. So I'll just give you a, 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 a brief overview of our programs with a little bit more detail about what's going on with the, with our, the gorillas. So I'm often asked why after 40 years, you know, what do you know? Why is it necessary to keep studying the gorillas after all of this time? And it's really quite simple. Um, if you want to conserve an animal, you need to know what it eats, you need to know where it ranges, and you need to know how much land you have and how many animals can be supported in, in, in that area. So basically, it's an understanding of your, the behavior, the ecology, and the demography of the mountain gorillas is what, we have been, what we've been studying. If we had stopped um, after the first 10 years, we had found that the gorillas were, the groups in this time were quite small. We had on 
average maybe 12 individuals, between 6 and 25 gorillas per group. Uh, we had few males gorillas in each of these groups, one or two silverbacks, one or two blackbacks, maybe on average three uh, males in the, in the group. However, what we're seeing now over the last five, six years is a change in the, uh, a dramatic change in the social composition. Our current groups have become increasingly larger. We've had one group that reached 65 individuals, and we'll talk a little bit about that group later. And we're finding that the groups have had gone through a period where there were many, many males in the groups. We've had up to six silverbacks regularly inside a group at one time. I think we've had up to nine on one occasion um, in one group. Um, and now we have an average of around nine adult males per, per gor gorilla group. So that's a dramatic change which is going to have an impact on the uh, social organization. So there's basically two different methods which we can use to study demography, um, we, which is the, the births and the de deaths and the, the transfer of gorilla individuals. We can use censuses, which means a total count or an attempt at a total account of the population. Um, and this will provide you with a good snapshot um, of the entire population um, at one moment in time. And this can be repeated over time to monitor to change. Um, we can also do long-term monitoring of known individuals. And that's what our work at Karasoki is all about. And this provides a longitudinal evaluation of individual life histories. Um, if we look at the census data, this is a graph showing, if you look on the um, axis here, you can see from that, so basically from the first census and we're in the early 70s up to 2003. You can see how the popula population was declining, and then we've seen this, this growth in the, the population in the last census, which was in 2003. However, I hope you can see there the, the solid line is the actual population size that we, re we recorded, whereas the two lines above were two predictions for how much the population could have grown based on the previous growth rate during, excuse me, during the 1980s. So whilst it's a, a success story that the gorilla population has increased in size, there's obviously some factors which are influencing its growth rate. So it's not achieving, uh, achieving um, what could be predicted as optimal. But as we all know, populations are comprised of individuals. And the work that we're doing is studying these individuals. Not all individuals do equally well. So how do we examine the variation between individuals and assess what variables influence an individual's reproductive success? How to, to determine which strategies yield the highest reproductive success and what may limit it? And to, in order to answer these questions, we need long-term monitoring of known individuals which provides a longitudinal evaluation of individual life histories. So what type of variables are we talking about? Well, if we take female reproductive success, the type of variables which may influence is a female's age. So reproductive success is how many infants does a female produce during her lifetime, which ultimately is contributing to that growth of the population. So the age of the female, her physical condition, um, her longevity, the group size which she's living in, her dominance rank, the group type, whether it's a one male group or a multi male group, um, and the ecological conditions can all be factors which you could suppose may influence a, a female's success. And to give you an, an idea about how, how we collect this information on individuals, this is a female that, this is information from our database from a female called Effie who was first studied by Diane Fossey in 1967. And we can see, we don't need to look at all of the data, but we can see that each line is another of her offspring. Um, and then if we take the, one of these offspring, Puck, we can then see how Puck has contributed to the population as each of these lines is an, one of Puck's offspring. Um, in comparison, if we take another of Effie's offspring, Maggie, we can see how Maggie has contributed to the population, and we can see that she's had a higher percentage of her, of her infant die. And so what we're interested in is why has Maggie not fared so far as well as Puck has been faring in her, in her? What are the individual differences? Is it dominance? 
Is it to do with uh, um, any of those factors that we, that we mentioned before? And then we can look at one of Puck's inf uh, infants and how she's gone on to re reproduce. And so far, she's had three infants, two which, who, uh, who continue to live. Um, and she's just starting her reproductive career. So this is the type of information that we're collecting and recording on a daily, daily basis. This is a, a diagram which shows you all of the groups that we have monitored over time. The, on, the, on the axes, you can see the different group names um, and time along the bottom. So you can see we've seen the formation and um, of, of and continued the or disintegration of a number of different groups over over time. And what are some of the key results that we have found just from these, these demographic analysis, just looking at this 40 years of births and deaths and, and, and transfer? We found that there is evidence that there is a female dominance hierarchy. I mean, several previous studies just over a short period of time, and when we say short, we mean 18 months, two years, uh, a study in the gorillas, there was no sign that there was a dominance rank. There was no sign of an alpha female um, at all. But when we look at 40 years of data overall, we can see that the, the females can be classified as high or, or, or low ranking. So maybe that's one of these individual variables. We found that when we look at, when the, the, uh, we look at maternal investment, we find that mothers, there's some evidence that suggests that mothers are investing more in their sons than their daughters if that is linked to their dominance rank. So... Um, Yeah, so without going into too much detail. So, <laughs> but it's, another, it's a sign that dominance rank is important and it's something that is interplaying in a, in a, in a female guerrilla strategy. We've looked at the, we talked about how female transfer was one of the, the major uh, observations. Um, and it was assumed that female transfer was particularly natal transfer, that's when a female transfers from a natal group, is due to inbreeding avoidance. Because usually you'd have one silverback and he's high likelihood that he was her father. So before breeding, she would move on to another group. However, when we look at 40 years worth of data, life gets a little bit more complicated. And as with everything, it's hard to be general. Um, there are certainly some females that transfer groups um, to avoid inbreeding avoidance, but maybe that's only accounts for about a third of the, the females that we've been, we've been studying. We then thought, well, maybe it's the group composition. They might prefer to be in groups which are multi-male rather than single male, because then they'll have more males in the group, more adult males, to protect their infants from infanticide. And there is some evidence to suggest this, but again, it's, it's, uh, there is some, also some evidence. It, it's not... It's not terribly clear, but that's probably the clearest result which is actually coming out. We also looked at group size because you were looking at optimum social organization. You would predict that a, a female would want to be in a smaller group in terms of the amount of time she would have to spend traveling to look for food. You'd expect females to, travel, to transfer from, small to, from large to small groups. Again, not really any evidence for this. And then we thought, well, perhaps it, what's the cost of transferring? So do you see that if a female transfers between different groups, that it reduces the number of infants that she is able to rear over her lifetime? And again, not really any evidence for this. So again, this is, this is the scientific data, which I think just proves what all of us in the field feel, is that the more we know, the, least, the less we know, and the more there is still to, to try and figure out. But we have to remember that after 40 years, we're basically just seeing one generation of gorillas. Gorilla's lifetime is about 40 years, 35 to 40 years. So we're only just being able to answer some of these basic things, such as what is the average lifespan. So, um, yeah, so it's extremely exciting to be working on this data and um, trying to fathom it all out. So that was the first 40 years. And then 2007 came along. And this year has been totally different. So none of this information I'm going to talk about now was included in the previous analyses. But just to give you a flavor about how things just keep changing. And I think if there's any of you here who follow the stories of the Karasuki gorillas, you'll be very interested to know what's going on. 
So we started the year with the, the three research groups that we've been studying in the same composition since 1993. So that's Pablo's group, Bitsmi's group, and Schindler's group. Um, in total, we monitor around 122 gorillas. That includes lone silverbacks and, um, and, and, and the groups. And 116 of these individuals we've been able to monitor since their birth. So we've got really good, complete life history data on this. And all of these three groups at the beginning of the year were all multi-male groups with between five and six silverbacks. However, this year we've been able to witness the formation of two new research groups. Um, and this is very exciting for us because a lot of that change in group composition that you saw on an earlier slide was a result of poaching um, and habitat degradation. So this is really exciting that we can report that these group formations are happening as part of a natural uh, process. So one of these groups is Isabukuru. He is the name of the young silverback. Um, and the way that his group formed, there were some females who transferred into Pablo's group from another group. Um, and then he split off from the group in June this year. And he's been, fo he's been forming his own new group. We kind of call it subgroup because anything, anything could change. But up until now, he's, he's leading it as his own group. And he's sort of staying in a very small home range area. He's not expanding very far. Um, I think he's focusing on consolidating his, his relationships in the group. Um, and I like these two photos. Both are Isabukuru. Um, and they illustrate the behavior we've been seeing when these males form groups and when they, they leave groups with individuals. They go through a period of, this is a strut stance. If you can see, he's very stiff leg like this. This is kind of a, like an aggressive display that he will do in, in front of the females. He'll herd the females. He'll be aggressive to the females to, to, to make them follow him. Sometimes you'll see at the beginning that the females will be leading, the male is following, and you think, mm, maybe this won't work out. But once you get into a position where the male is leading and the females um, are following, it's a relatively more, more stable uh, group. You see these small groups are very cohesive as well. The distances between the gorillas are very, are very close. And then when they're not sort of displaying at each other, you have these big uh, affiliation periods where you see a lot more grooming activity between the females and each other, and particularly the, the, the silverback. And then another group that we've been following since the end of last year is Buenge's group. And this group started when, a, this is the group here, and this group started when Buenge, who was a young male in the group, he left again with a recently transferred female, Bushushwe. However, shortly afterwards, Bushushwe transferred again into Shinda's group. So for the first time that we've recorded, Buengi went back to his natal group. So he was accepted back into to Beatsmith's group. And then he later tried his luck with a young female from Beatsmith's group. And they set out uh, together for, for, for a while. Um, and that was successful. And then at the beginning of this year, he was able to, um, to take four more females to come over from Pablo's group. And then now, he's even increased his group size, you can see here, as, he, as three other females have, have now joined. However, Isaro, who you remember was the little female from Beatsmith's group, has now transferred to Pablo's group, and then on again to Isabukuru's group. <laughs> so that's just one of the many events that we've been recording since 2007 going on. Um, yeah, but it's very interesting for us to be, to be recording all of these days. At the same time, in Beatsmith's group, we've been recording a split in this group. For a couple of years now, I think maybe even three years, we've been recording a dominance change between the two dominant silverbacks, Titus and Kuriyama. Um, and Titus is probably the oldest silverback in the Virunga volcanoes. He's been dominant in Beatsmith's group for 15 years. Um, and a little, sort of at the end of last year, it sort of became obvious that the group was going to split rather than just have a change in dominance within and maintain the group as one, um, which was a little bit surprising because the leader of the second group, Kuriyama, is Titus's son. So it would feed well into the, the model of the young male taking over and leading the, leading the group. 
Um, but this, we started to observe the, the actual splitting in a regular basis in, in March 2007. That's, we still say split when they spend the night apart, not just foraging during the day, but actually two nest sites. Um, and this year they've spent a, a total of 151 days separate, but they come together again and, and then they go away. But really since June, they've been pretty much nesting apart at night, even if they come together during the day. And the group composition here has been pretty much consistent with all of these splits, with the exception of the dominant female, who seems to swap now and then to maintain dominance <laughs> in both of the groups with her family. And then we put, I don't know really how to term this, so I've called it Pablo's group disintegration. Um, Pablo's group was the largest gorilla group that has ever been recorded. And this was a group that reached 65, oops, we've gone green. Um, there's a cord somewhere. Anyway, they, they reached the 65 individuals. And what we saw when this happened, this was late last year, um, we, we we saw sort of an increase in the aggression within the group. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'll stand still. <laughs> so we saw for the... Um, we, we have almost confirmed sightings for... And I didn't touch anything. <laughs> Do you want to just leave it? Okay. Um, we saw that there was increased aggression both amongst the males but also between the females. We saw one female lose her infant as a result of an aggressive attack with another female in the group. We also saw another female lose her infant through infanticide but with a male from within the same group. So normally infanticide happens intergroup, but this was an intra-group um, infanticide. We also saw um, mother-infant separation. I think 65 gorillas was just too many gorillas to move cohesively through the forest. And we had several incidences where infants were separated from their mothers um, and then later died as a result of hyponutrition. Uh, um, although we did have one female infant who was um, separated, who later was able to rejoin, rejoin the group. But this period, basically from September to December, September, November last year, was really characterized by a high infant mortality in the group. Um, and then the result of this was that um, at the beginning of this year, four of the females that had lost infants transferred out of the groups. And this may have been one of the sparks, together with that split in Beatsme's group, which led to a lot of the female transfers and the shake-up that we've been seeing this year. Um, so it's interesting that it seems, certainly from looking at the long-term data, there's a suggestion of infanticide avoidance when females are transferring between groups. And our anecdotal records this year show that the females, in fact, in this case, these females had lost not only their previous infant, their, 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 their most recent but their two, most recent in female, uh, their two most recent infants had not survived in Pablo's group. So it's really like there was a conscious decision for protection of their infants to move. So just we gave you a little, gave you a little bit of a flavor of what's going on. I'm not sure if I really got over how crazy it's been. So just in case, this year we've recorded up to now 21 different gorillas, females, that have transferred between groups. And just to put some reference to that, in the whole 40-year data set, we only have 46 females. So we've had 50% increase just within the first half, well, uh, 10 months of this year. We've had over 40 transfer events. That means that each of those females has an average made about two different transfers before settling, maybe, into their groups. Um, and as comparison, we've had uh, only 61 transfer events in the last 40 years. So it's really a period of change. Um, and we've had 54 group interactions. That's when different groups come together, which is when gorillas transfer. Um, and up until the beginning of this year, we were looking at an average of one per month. So it's really been a, a year of um, flux um, uh, and change. I think this is partly, as we talked about, those females losing their infants 
um, and, and moving groups, because when females have a young infant, of course, they're restrained from tra moving between groups because of the risk of infanticide. But we've also had, after a long period of stability, we've had a lot of young females that are growing up who are now at the age to transfer, perhaps before having their first infant. And we've also had a lot of young males growing up in these groups, these groups of many males, which is um, also given more opportunities for, for, for transfer. And this is just two females here, Mwingu and Makuba, um, who both have, just very quickly, Mwingu is in Bitsby's group. She transferred to a lone silverback with Makuba, and then they transferred on to an unhabituated group over um, on the Congolese side of the Vrungas. Makuba, the other female, she started off in Pablo's group, transferred to Bitsby's group, with the lone silverback and onto an unabituated group. So you can see the sort of hops that the females are doing before they settle into their groups. If that's not crazy enough, this is a, a diagram of their home ranges. So usually you would see three circles up there for the three research groups. Um, but each one of those multicolored circles represents a different group or subgroup that we've been following over the course of this year. And I think it's quite dramatic to see just how many gorillas are being supported in this one small area of the Virungas. So we'll keep watching <laughs> here. Uh, just quickly about the lone silverbacks. These are, these are very exciting to me because these are guys that we've followed since they were born. So we have their complete life history and we can compare perhaps why these, these lone males, these individuals have become low males or solitary males and why others have stayed in the group. So we have now a total of seven silverbacks, which we are following. And I'd just like to put one happy story in, is that Inshuti has finally uh, found a, a female and is wandering around as a couple. So the, one of our questions has always been, these lone silverbacks, what are their chances of reproductive success? Once they become a lone silverback, is that them for, for life, or what's the frequency that they can form their own groups? So all of this is really giving us uh, unprecedented research opportunities. So these recent demographic changes provide incredible opportunities to learn more about these female transfer decisions, the reasons for the male dispersal, effects of group size on, on social dynamics. We've gone from 65 to six individuals in a group. We can look at multi-male versus single male groups. Um, this is something that we haven't been able to look at for a long period of, uh, of time. Um, very interesting to see these groups forming um, and disintegrating um, as natural processes um, and to follow the dominance changes both in, with um, Titus and, and Kuriyama but also in these silver, uh, the females in these new groups as they, they split and form. So that's what's been going on in Rwanda. Um, you can see the red dot there is the site of the original Karasoki Research Center, and that's the site where all of our work has been going on, where we're seeing the success, uh, successful gorilla growth. Um, just across the border in the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo in Virunga National Park, the same contiguous habitat, but as Claire alluded to this morning, uh, earlier, the, the situation has not been so it's been it's a disaster for gorillas at the moment. Um, just one thing I'd like to point out on this map is you can see this, the line that runs through the middle of the Virunga volcanoes is the international boundary. And you can see that the majority of the gorilla habitat is on the Congolese side. So if we're to ensure the future of the mountain gorillas, we, need, we really need to ensure that those gorillas are protected too. Now I haven't given you any numbers as yet, but in that that area there, we have 380 mountain gorillas um, as the result of the 2003 census. But this year in Congo, there's been a total of 10 gorillas killed um, and two gorillas that are, that are missing. And this is a result of the insecurity and unrest in, in that area of the park. Um, and as a result of this, we've had two additional gorilla infants. Both of these infants were found on their, well, one of the infants was found on his, um, his dead mother's uh, body. The other infant was rescued 
from the group um, as he was being carried by a, a black, a young black back uh, male in the group. So these these gorillas bring the total number of gorillas, confiscated gorillas or orphaned gorillas, in our care to ten. Um, that's four mountain gorillas and six uh, growry or, or lowland uh, gorillas. And we work in close partnership with the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project to provide veterinary care for these orphans. Um, and we work together with the park authorities to work out plans for their long-term care and possible reintroduction to the forest. But, um, yeah, it's... Uh, and so those 10 gorillas, when you look at the, the growth that we might have seen in that population from 2003 till now, basically knocks the growth back. So when we look at that, if we remember that earlier graph that was showing the trajectory of, of growth and we weren't reaching optimal growth, it's basically because of insecurity. Um, and so DFGFI is now helping the park authorities to continue protection and monitoring assessing the situation on a day-to-day -day basis, being ready to, to respond when, it, when, when possible. Okay, so then that, that's a, an overview of uh, the, the, our guerrilla research program, a little bit of an update from Congo. Um, recently, we've been getting involved in other species um, in the Virunga volcanoes. Um, these are the golden monkeys. The... Virunga Volcanoes falls within one of Conservation International hotspots. It's part of the eastern Afromontane hotspots um, in a region called the, the Albertine Rift. Um, why these areas are, are important is because of the number of endemic species, that's species which are only found in those areas, and in the total number or the species richness in those areas. Um, and to understand why this, why this is like this, if we look at the distribution of forests uh, um, in history, this is 18,000 years BC, approximately, we can see the, the sort of the east and the, the west forest distribution. And then these forests then went on to expand throughout that central belt of, of Africa. But it's those original places, if you see the red areas, which um, maintain the highest number of species and this species endemism. These species are, are only found there. Now, this is the, uh, particularly for phytodiversity, uh, or the plants. Um, and a quick example of impatience, which is the same species is found only in two localities, in the east and the, in the west of, of Africa. You've got the, yeah. And if we just quickly go back to our map of the gorillas, we can see this closely matches the distribution of gorillas in, in, across Central Africa. So we're looking at some of these endemic uh, species and threatened species as our priority. This is the golden monkey. This is the only other primate species in the Virunga volcanoes. Um, it is only found in the Virunga volcanoes. And this is Deo, who's leading our research program and has just completed a census, but we don't yet have the numbers, for, for the number of, gorilla, uh, number of uh, golden monkeys in the Virunga volcano. And we have similar programs working on birds. Um, and this is the Grower's rush warbler. Um, again, only found in this part of Africa. Um, numbers for the Virunga volcanoes were thought to be estimated to be around 1,000 we've actually found less than 150 of these individuals. Um, and now IUCN is using this data to, to reclassify its threatened uh, listing. Um, we also have a program looking at the plants, trying to establish an in-depth herbarium of the plant species in this area. Um, we're starting, this is bamboo forest. Of course, the bamboo is incredibly important as a food source for the gorillas, also for the golden monkeys. Um, and also for the, the buffalo in the park, um, and some monitoring of some of the endemic, pardon me, orchids uh, in the forest. Um, the habitats, the yeah, Afro-Montane habitats are also very important for um, a wide range of other animals, and especially for Dwight. We have the Karasimbi tree frog. 
we had a student who's working with uh, Dwight Lawson uh, studying the amphibians this summer. The last work that was done on these amphibians was in the 1950s. So we really don't have very up-to-date records or even very complete records. And the taxonomies, I understand, is a, is a complete mess. Um, but this, the, these, this species, um, and then also from the top of uh, Vesoki in the volcanoes, and another species here, um, are, I, I believe are endemic to, to, to the Virunga, to Rwanda, and I think also to the Virungas. Um, and this chameleon species also is only found here. So we're only just starting to get an idea of some of the other biodiversity that is sharing that habitat with the gorillas. Then an important thing about what, we're, what we do in the way that we work at Karasoki is that all of our programs um, are focused on capacity building of the Rwandan scientists. Um, that insecurity during the 1990s resulted in a real dearth of conservation biologists. Um, the genocide really hit hard anybody with um, academic uh, training. So we've been working since 2002 closely with the National University of Rwanda to encourage students um, and train students with an inter in interest in uh, conservation biology and, and hopefully primatology. Um, just to get an idea of it, when, when I went in 2002, we actually had some funding from USAID to hire some scientists. And I went to the um, biology department and said, can you give me some recommendations? And in 2002, there wasn't anybody who had graduated in biology since 1994. So it was really starting. There were four students currently studying, but not yet completed the, their courses. So Rwanda is a very densely populated country, just three national parks. Um, and so people have very little opportunity to interact with wildlife, to enter a national park, to really... How can you know if you have an interest in conservation biology if you've never really experienced wildlife? So that's what we've been, been trying to do is, is open up our interest and our enthusiasm for gorillas and biodiversity to the young students in Rwanda. We've produced a series of different training manuals. Um, and we now have around 200 students a year come through our facility for various internships and, and field courses. They cl climb the volcanoes. Um, get their feet muddy. Um, they learn what every good zoologist needs to do and that life revolves around poop. And here we are, we are measuring gorilla poop, which is the census methods we use in, in census. Um, and also they spend time with our trackers, with the gorillas, and get an opportunity to learn about gorilla behavior. We've also, uh, we also mentored several students to come through and study uh, for their undergraduate theses with our, with our scientists at our project. We also train the park staff. We do some training for the tourist guides about gorilla behavior and some of the other biodiversity in the park. And we've helped the National Park Service establish a, a national biodiversity database where information about all of the different species um, in the, the national parks can be, can be found. And also an extremely important component of the work that we do with our own staff, well, is the work that we do with our own staff for training. Um, and now we're able to, to say that we have sent three staff members to complete their master's courses um, overseas. Um, um, in this photo here on the right, you'll see Felix, who is currently in Oxford studying for his master's in primate conservation. Um, over here is Prosper who has just completed a master's in research uh, methodologies. And a marbler here has just this month gone to Germany to study for his master's in, in botany. And this is really exciting because this will be the first time that scienti Rwandan scientists will really be trained in some of the techniques to become primatologists. Because what we really need is um, Rwandan primatologists that can really understand the value of their gorillas and the scientific value and their importance in, in conservation. So we're very excited about this. And I have on here a picture of Winnie, and it's just a way, one of the ways we work. She's a student at a university in the UK, and as part of her PhD, she, her uh, university has been helping to sponsor Prosper to come for his master's program. 
Another way that we've been able to, to help foster that interest and um, expand upon that, well, help foster the interest, but also I think it, to sh- just to show as well the importance of the mountain gorillas to, to Rwanda and how the, 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 they're recognized by the, the government is that Ru- the Rwandan government hosted the first international research conference in Rwanda this year. And the subject of that conference was uh, conservation and biodiversity. So I think it's a a tremendous um, testament to the seriousness that Rwanda um, takes in the conservation of the mountain gorillas. The opening speech of the conference was by the president himself, President Kagame. Um, We had over 350 participants from from 20 different countries. And we had over 50 students from within Rwanda participating. This is an opportunity for scientists in Rwanda to mix with international scientists without traveling outside of Rwanda. And it had a great amount of enthusiasm from this. Um, and we were especially grateful uh, that Russell Mitamai, who's the president of Conservation International, came over and opened the conference. And this is him standing next to... President Kagame. So, just to finish some future directions, where do we want to go next? Um, We want to continue with the activities that we're doing. As I mentioned before, Rwanda is within the center of the Albertine Rift, that hotspot within um, one of Conservation International's biodiversity hotspots. It borders all of the other five countries within within the Albertine Rift. Um, And the announced at this, at this conference where the Rwanda's wishes to build a regional center of excellence for gorilla and biodiversity research. So to able to achieve this, we'd like to invest further in our infrastructure so that we can have uh, training facilities, dormitories, offices, back up, not inside the park, but back up next to the, the park area to support our activities. We currently rent a whole series of different houses in town. It's going to need a lot more training and capacity building of the Rwandan scientists looking long-term into PhD programs. Um, networking of scientists within the region. This is what we do with our scientists at Karasoki, scientists in Congo coming to international conferences. Um, we'd like to expand our research programs. Um, we're working at this year of the 40th anniversary. We're working on the digitization of the 40 years of, of records of all of those onion skin typed field notes that Diane Fossey first took, Tara has been taking a lead role in scanning and dig- or organizing the scanning and digitization so that all of those databases will be uh, searchable. And of course, we'd like to further de- develop collaborations to help achieve all of these goals. So just to finish, I think it's remarkable when I look back at the history of Karasoki about how it started with one woman's vision and a, and a tent in the, between those volcanoes, and how much the activities have grown both at Karasoki Research Center and for gorilla protection in general. So I thank you very much to Zurich Lancia, and thank you very much for listening to me this, this evening. Although it's difficult to see you. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have any specific questions? Or? Yes. Can you, um, I've heard you speak at um, the film that Andrew Young had been involved in. And you yeah. talked a little bit about what the fund is also doing for the people yeah. of Rwanda to, to, to do this, but you also have to think about Well, it is, and I. You know, you need to look at the economic impact of 85 employees alone at Karasuki. It's a huge economic impact in Rwanda. But we recognize that our concept that Katie alluded to of ecosystem health, we consider an ecosystem a whole geographic ecosystem. And within that ecosystem 
of humans. So we don't look at, I mean, yes, there is a national park and there are rules, so that national park should be sacrosanct. But that isn't the whole ecosystem. Just like the gorillas don't recognize the border between Rwanda and Congo, neither do plants and other animal species. So we work particularly with communities which exist close to protected areas. So we do that in Rwanda, and we do it in much more remote areas in Congo. Rwanda, as Katie said, is a highly densely populated country. So we work in villages in very rural communities, really trying to help them with very basic human needs. Access to water, improved education, improved health care through the rehabilitation of rural health clinics, um, sanitation, and hygiene and sanitation education, and then also treatment, because the biggest problem we see in very remote communities is very, very high levels of intestinal parasites. They are endemic, as some of these wonderful species are, but so are the parasites. Um, we have a partnership with Pfizer, which has been very generous in giving us about a million dollars of medication. And we are then able with this, um, you know, I like to describe the Dying Posse Gorilla Fund as a on-the-ground conservation delivery organization. That's what we do. We're on the ground. We're not in cities. We, well, we're in Atlanta. <laughs> but what we are is we're out in very, very remote areas and in very rural areas and in very poor areas. So we go to the communities and we ask them, and we go to the governments and we ask them. In Rwanda, they have a poverty reduction strategy plan. They also have a health plan. And we go to them and we say, how can we help you achieve your goals? And then we work with them and with private donors to achieve some of those goals. And they are all very similar in Rwanda and Congo. It is enhancing education and bringing basic health care and sanitation and protein access and some small microfinance projects to make sustainable small businesses um, become much more ubiquitous throughout the region. All of the people that we work with in Rwanda and the people that we work with in Congo don't want handouts. They want to be, for the first time for some of them, in Congo especially, they would like to be in charge of their own lives. They would like to be able to plan that their children might stay in school. They would like to be able to plan that they may be able to have a cash producing crop or a small business, uh, and they have aspirations just like we do. So those portions of our program are covered by a program we call the Ecosystem Health and Community Development Project, and it's a very important part of what we do. And in Rwanda is helped tremendously by the 85 Karasoki employees. But thank you for asking that. I think I know what you're going to ask. <laughs> Maybe not. But this is an amazing occurrence because when we first, when I first went to Rwanda in 1995, which was a year after the genocide. Was that the Oh. The education program. Oh, back in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. The National University of Rwanda lost 80% of its faculty in the genocide. And it, it's hard to imagine how you, you can recover from that. Okay. Yes. I am an educator in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Children. 
Well, what we'd like to do is we'd like to stop being the best kept secret in Atlanta for a start. That's one big thing. Um, Who can ask this little boy to answer? I've never met before. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Would you like to answer that? <laughs> He's got some ideas.